Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. And aloha. Welcome to another edition of Hawaiian Uniform. I'm your host, Calvin Griffin. And uh, those of you who've seen the program before, you know we mainly concentrate on veterans and military issues and those who help to support uh, those who are supporting our country. Uh, today, I have a very special guest, Mr. Bob McDermott, who is a state representative of the 4th District. 40th District. 40th yeah. District. I'm sorry, I knocked off yeah. zero, you know. No, there you but, go. Uh, yeah, I want to thank you for coming on the yes, program. Yes, sir. Yeah. I know that um, the reason why I asked you down, you know, to for the program originally was uh, I know that uh, here in the program we've been talking about Branch 46 and their right. efforts to keep uh, the property they have down there uh, for their members and also uh, the vets. And you were uh, instrumental or very in helping out. Help, helped out, yeah. yeah. So the, the Branch 46 as a... So it's a veterans program. So I want to tell your your viewers out there that I, I was a Marine. Mm -hmm. I guess I still am, right? But that was a hundred pounds ago, yeah. right? So a Marine veteran, and uh, did the first Gulf War. Uh, I was enlisted and an officer. Got out after four years. Uh, came back in with a college degree. And became a ninety day wonder, right? A second mm -hmm. lieutenant, and. Uh, but then I ran the Navy League for 12 years, and that's where I got to know the Fleet Reserve, because the Navy League and the Fleet kind of have similar missions, but not exactly, right. and um, they're very close to each other, mm -hmm. but they're both Navy-centric, if you will, although they support all the sea services, mm -hmm. the Coast Guard, the Merchant Marine, the Marine Corps, and the Navy. Most people don't think about all those groups right, yeah. when we talk about the sea services, <laughs> right? Uh, fleet Reserve supports all of them, so does the Navy League. And of course, being at the Navy League um, influenced my sons because I have two that joined the Navy. Mm -hmm. One's a boatswain's mate, one is a, a, a CB. And I had a boy who's in the Marine Corps, he's, he's out now. So when you think about 1% of Americans today join the military, yep. and our family, because of the influence of the Navy League and myself and my wife, We've steered all our boys to go in there because we think it's such a great opportunity for young men and women to get a start. Yep. And that's the Marine Corps was the greatest thing that ever happened to me, both enlisted and as an officer. I wouldn't want to do it again. I'm too old, but uh, at the time it was great. Yep. And uh, great training, leadership, particularly OCS and uh, the basic school, you learn how to be a leader. Not everyone's a born leader. Yeah. Some people are. You learn leadership, mm -hmm. and it was just a great, great place to, to start. So, yeah. dovetail into Branch 46, mm -hmm. um, you, and I'll let you expound upon the challenges that you've had in fundraising, but the state gave them a grant of $300,000, right. which was extraordinary. I can tell you, Romy Cachola, Representative Cachola from Kalihi, got that grant. Mm -hmm. I was shocked that they gave it to you because it was such a large amount of money. They usually don't give that out unless to groups like the Aviation Museum right, yeah. or Pearl Harbor <coughs> Visitor Center. Mm -hmm. So the Fleet Reserve to get that was really wonderful and a testament to Cachola and the folks at the fleet who lobbied to, to get that. Yeah, I think a lot of people uh, has been there for quite some time anyhow. And so, uh, you want to explain the financial situation and where they're at and how they got there oh. so the vo folks at home know what we're talking okay. about? Yeah, basically what it is is like, you know, the only reason why I, I uh, like I said, I'm not actually a member. I mean, I'm a member as far as what's called Lounge Lizard, you know, yeah. the group anyhow, but uh, just being a concerned veteran. Um, but as far as, you know, speaking to the specifics of what they're dealing with right now, I can just, you know, tell you what's been released to the public, right. you know, that they want. Uh, but yeah, it's been a, you know ongoing battle for them to go ahead and try to raise the money to um, keep the place going anyhow. Um, but a lot of people are not even aware of its existence, you know, even those in the, in the military. But uh, for the even with the lack of um, public uh, awareness awareness of the organization anyhow, the number of people that go through there, the, the important thing about this organization and this location is that we have a lot of individuals who serve fire. And there's a lot of good people that go through there that do a lot of good things in the, in the, in the community, you know. So, um, you know, that's a base, part of what's going on. But as far as the effort to go ahead and the, for the finances, uh, there are it's starting to generate the, um, as far as the interest, especially with the influx of the 300,000, you know, that has been uh, allocated anyhow. So there's still about 150, dollars $200,000 short, you know. Right. But, um, 
again, this is a real shot in the arm, like I say, to motivate the community and also the members. The members. So the, yep. the issue is they're on Navy land, mm -hmm. it's excess Navy land. The right. Navy said, okay, you've got to buy this piece of land Correct, yeah. at fair market value. You have three years to do it. And the price was $800,000 or something like that. Yeah. So through their own fundraising efforts and through the grant, and um, they're about uh, 150,000, 200,000 short. Right. They got another year extension to mm -hmm. get that. Uh, that should be doable. But, you know, the Fleet Reserve's profile of their membership, right, yeah. are more enlisted, retired enlisted guys or enlisted guys, where the Navy League is more officer, right. uh, retired officers. That's the one thing I noticed, right? So the, fl <laughs> the Fleet Reserve has a bar and a lounge, so they do have a profit center. Yeah. You were indicating, and, and it's, they didn't, because they were a nonprofit, they weren't real strict in how they ran it. I'm not saying there's any theft or anything, it's just a little sloppy, ordering too much inventory right. and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, there was a, a question, like say, uh, uh, how did the, the organization get in that position in the first place? Again, I don't have, you know, I'm not of any authority right now to speak on behalf or for or against, you know, what was happening. But a lot of people are hoping, like say, with the way things, with the changes that could possibly come about, that whatever what led up to the situation right now where they need the influx or, you know, the right. capital to save the place, that it would not happen again, you know? Well, they paid the building they own outright, which right, is yeah. probably a million and a half dollars, mm -hmm. I would guess, to build that today. It's huge. Well, you know, to build it would be cheaper, but its value, right. if you on the open market, that lot and mm -hmm. the building would be at least 1.5 million, if not more. Oh, more. So, yeah. yeah, so it's, it, and, and um, they own the building, and you just have to buy the land because it was excess in land and the Navy wants to get rid of it. The Navy doesn't want to be liable for anything, right? right yeah. So this is where they have to raise money and there wasn't a real sense of urgency. Mm -hmm. And what I, when I point out the guys were retired and enlisted, that means that they're not wealthy guys. They're, right. they're, they have a pension and they provide for their family, but they don't have a whole lot of, they're not gonna make a $5,000 donation because they don't have it. Right. Um, and so they have to get into fundraising, which they've never had to do before because the bar kind of raised enough money to keep them afloat, pay their bills, pay the electricity, you know, right? And since they didn't have to pay any rent mm -hmm. because they were a dollar a year lessee to the Navy, right? They were fine. Yeah, I think, you know, sometimes it's just, um, well, I'm trying to think of the term proper, but anyhow, a lot of people assumed that someone else was going to step up to the yes, plate. Yes, that's the way know. it always is. It's somebody yeah. else taking it. The right. other guy. You know, yeah, somebody's, you know, somebody's going to write a big check and I'm not going to have to get involved, you know, but now, you know, with this, the situation, again, I think people are starting to, starting to motivate them where they fully realize the impact. If this place goes away, how it's going to impact the community because, again, it's a gathering place or the epicenter in some cases for all the different branches because even though it's a Navy um, operation, you know, as far as the charter and everything else, you have all the different branches of service that go in there, mainly as associate members, you know, they come in. They hold uh, promotions there. They oh, hold yeah. uh, events there, recognition events for right. Sailor of the Year, mm -hmm. lunches and things of that nature. They have a, a nice big uh, buffet area or room of mm -hmm. dining room that they rent out now, and they're gonna get more aggressive in that because the rentals for rooms for high school graduations and parties uh, is very competitive. I mean, there's not a lot of places you can rent for 500 bucks yep. uh, for an evening right. for your high school graduation, for your mm -hmm. kids' graduation. They have plenty of parking. It's conveniently located right in the corner of uh, Volkenberg and Nimitz, right? So it's right next to Holy Family School for those folks who you don't know, across from Navy Marine Golf Course. So it's right on the main drag. So it's a very, very valuable piece of property. Yeah. Yeah, no, right now, because they have the rail that's going to be running past there, skirting, yeah. you know, the operation anyhow. But, um, yeah, you know, not to, um, uh, what you call it? How not close to is it going to run? How close? Right, I think right like above about it? 50 feet or less. Really? <laughs> So they could hop off the, the rail and come out and, you yeah, know. I'll tell you a lunch. funny story about the Fleet Reserve. So my father, <laughs> who's dead now, but uh, yeah. rest in peace, he, he uh, lived with us in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And he was just a handful. Yeah. Uh, and, he, of course, he was a drunk. So what I would do in the afternoon is take him over to the Fleet about 1 o'clock and drop him off. Yeah. Because their bar is like any town USA. Yeah. You could be in Milwaukee, Cleveland. You don't know where the heck you are. You go in, it's 25-cent draft yeah. at the time. So I just sit him at the bar, give him 10 bucks, and come back in five hours. Mm -hmm. He's making friends and having a good time. <laughs> yeah, the one thing about there at the police, you know, is just like, 
Uh, I know with the uh, with the MWR and some of the facilities closing down the different uh, bars and so on, you yeah. know, in the clubs. You know, you have a lot of people who still like to drink. And they drink responsibly, hopefully. Uh, but instead of going all the way down to Waikiki, you know, they can get you know the centrally located, is close to the base, and all that good stuff. Um, and on top of that, again, the knowledge that you learn. I mean, since I've been a member there, people that you run into from World War II, Vietnam, the whole nine yards, who are willing to share their stories, you know. And so it's not always about drinking and you know and getting, as I say, lit up, uh, but it's about sharing. And also, it helps with those individuals. Um, the ambiance, you know, of the military, you know, and there's yeah. very few places here on the island where you can go to except on base where you can feel like, so you're part of a group that understands where you're coming from, you know, yeah. and it becomes in a way, you know, a little cathartic or, you know, uh, sort of a uh, therapy session, you know. Well, you're common to bond, to right? Yeah, common bond, you know. Yeah. And um, like I say, that's the important thing about the place where you're able to go ahead and share. And even for young people, I think there's certain groups, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts may meet there, I'm not sure. But we do have, uh, I know that they do have family oriented operations, you know, the parties and things of that nature. But hopefully in the future, if they decide to do so, you know, cultivating the community spirit, you know, like say with, with the family type of thing, where they're able to come in and share and do um, things within the community. Because we have a lot of people there that um, on their own, I mean, they, they're not even part of any organization for the most part, except being a member of the lounge for the most part, if they're not qualified to be a um, full-fledged member. But we have a lot of unsung heroes out there, you know, in the, in the uh, veterans community that like, people rarely hear about. Uh, because they, you know, the spirit of giving, you know, that most veterans or military per people have. You get in, you get involved, you know. And, uh, I, you know, I'm quite sure you're familiar with that and your efforts with the veterans and the military. Yeah. Well, I was blessed because I got to run the Navy League for 12 years. Yeah. So I got to meet heroes. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm getting goosebumps, as I said, heroes that I would not normally meet. And I got to become friends, literally friends. Um, with folks that have an extraordinary uh, life story that you would never know that live in our community. Oh, yeah. I'll give you an example. Jim and Carol Hickerson. Mm. You ever heard of him? Yes, I have. Okay, Jim was a Vietnam POW for five and a half years. Uh -huh. Aviator shot down. When he got shot down, he was married. Mm -hmm. This is a By the way, this is a story that uh, Hollywood couldn't make up, folks. It's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. So he got shot down, he was married. Right. Jim Hickerson. Carol Hansen was married to a Marine helicopter pilot who got shot down around the same time. Mm -hmm. And he was last seen reaching into his helicopter for his pistol. Yeah. Being it's gonna be overrun by VC. Mm -hmm. But he was MIA, missing in action. Right. So he goes to the Hanoi Hilton for five and a half years. Mm -hmm. She uh, starts the League of Families with Sybil Stockdale. Mm -hmm. Her husband's MIA. Mm -hmm. Stockdale was MIA. He ended up at the Hanoi Hilton. Uh, and she begins meeting with the president, Henry Kissinger, uh, the Pope, uh, uh, you know, President Nixon, on and on, trying to get information, Governor Reagan at the mm -hmm. time, trying to get information on where her husband is. Mm -hmm. He's MIA. Where is he? Where is he? Because all they said is he's MIA. Mm -hmm. The end of the war comes. And um, Hickerson comes home, and his wife didn't wait for him. Mm. Uh, it's a sad story. But he's not bitter. She didn't wait for him. She moved on. Um, and uh, so he comes home, and, you know, while you're in prison, what are you thinking about, right? Wait till I get home to my wife, my yeah. wife. And all that, he put his hopes, and he comes home, and she's gone. Yeah. And Ka Carol Hickerson... Uh, uh, was finally told when the war ended, we've changed your husband's designation, we've debriefed some guys. Mm -hmm. He actually was overrun by the VC. He's KIA. Yeah. So, they meet at Ross Perot's, you gotta do a commercial? I do it, yeah. Do a commercial. It. Yeah, cause like I say, I don't wanna- So we're gonna do the meeting part where you come, right when we come back. <laughs> Hold that thought, we'll be right back. Uh, but we'll be back with Hawaii in uniform and uh, Representative uh, Bob McDermott. Welcome to Sister Power. I'm your host, Sharon Thomas Yarbrough, where we motivate, educate, empower, and inspire all women. We are live here every other Thursday at 4 p.m., and we welcome you to join us here at Sister Power. Aloha and thank you. Aloha. 
My name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea comes on every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join us. I like to bring in guests that talk about all types of things that come across the sea to Hawaii. Not just law, love, people, ideas, history. Please join us for Law Across the Sea. Aloha. Okay, you're back with Hawaii in uniform, and again, I'm your host, Calvin Griffin, and my special guest today is um, Representative Bob McDermott. And uh, Bob, to continue your story. So, okay, our story. So we're right where the Hickerson. So Jim came back and his wife moved on. Carol, uh, who was head of the National League of Families, uh, was finally told her husband was KIA. By the way, Carol was pregnant when he left. Mm. So she had a son who never met her father, her biological father, yeah. his biological father. Mm. Um, while she was doing this, by the way, John Wayne took an interest in Carol mm -hmm. and wore her husband's bracelets, Steve Hansen. Yeah. And you can see it in some of those movies in the early 70s. He's got the metal bracelet on, mm -hmm. POW bracelet. Uh, he, John Wayne sent Christmas gifts to her son every year, mm -hmm. even after the war was over, yeah. up till his death. Um, so Carol, Carol and Jim Hickerson had met once before. Now, their second meeting was at Ross Perot's... Uh, uh, in the Cotton Bowl, he welcomed all the POWs uh, home and uh, played Ty Tony Orlando sang Tile Yellow Ribbon around the old oak tree, which was a major hit at the time. Mm -hmm. Carol started crying. Mm -hmm. Jim was next to her. He leaned over, gave her a kiss. He mm -hmm. says, don't worry, little lady, it'll be okay. Yeah. He says that's the most expensive kiss he's ever made because eventually they got married <laughs> and started a family of their own. Yeah. And, uh, and adopted a couple children. And, and so I see Hollywood couldn't write a script like that. It would be too unbelievable. Right. You know? Okay. But it's a love story that still exists to this day. They're still alive. They live here right. in Honolulu. And they're wonderful patriots. Mm -hmm. They both bleed red, white, and blue. Yeah. Well, speaking of which, and I don't want to get too much into this, but I, uh, what I plan to do is in the future, we have a couple of um, authorities that, on POWs that... Um, came up with, of course, it's nothing that's new, but as far as when the Vietnam War ended, of course, they wanted to end it as soon as possible anyhow, and we had like 500 and some odd uh, POWs that were released. Right. Okay. Um, what their, well, some of the claims are is that the possibility that there were more POWs that were yeah, in Yeah, it always Vietnam. intrigued me. Yeah, because one of the things is that, uh, from the information I'm getting, is that the United States, through Kissinger or whoever our representatives were, had promised the Vietnamese government uh, billions of dollars in reparations, right. and they held the uh, POWs back as you know a bargaining chip. Anyhow, when the United States reneged on that promise to the Vietnamese government, then the POWs no longer became uh, were considered an asset. You know, and as far as some of the reports, possible executions, and even the possibility of still live POWs. Um, what we got, like say, sometime in the future, if you'd like to be part of that program or discuss it with us, we'd be more than happy to. You know, that always intrigued me, and that, I, you remember 1980, no. Lieutenant Colonel Bo Gritz mm -hmm. mounted a, he was going to mount an expedition to go mm -hmm. over and look yeah. for those guys. Um, that's the premise of the Rambo movies, right? Yeah. Um, and, and so that always intrigued me because there was still 1,500 unaccounted for or something yeah. like that. I mean, quite a few guys unaccounted for. Did some of them, and we don't even hear reports who, of some of them who voluntarily stayed. Yeah. Now, we know that happened in the Korean War. There's cases of a couple guys who walked over the, uh, they, they just went AWOL yeah. and ended up living in Korea and then Japan. That's yeah. one guy just passed away. Yeah. Couldn't really speak English anymore, as a matter of fact. Um, so we know there's cases of guys in the previous wars who deserted mm -hmm. and, and lived lives in those countries. Yeah. We never hear that about the Vietnam War, where guys who deserted the Americans and lived in North Vietnam. Yeah. Well, to be honest with you, I'm, pre I'm pleasantly surprised that you're, you're open to discussing or talking about it because most people, like I said, want to shy, especially in, the, in the, a political arena, like I said, would shy away from this, you know. But again, you get into history, and that always fascinates me. And like during World War II, you see the reports that there were hundreds of thousands of British, French, and American POWs that were never repatriated, that were sent to different parts of the world, Russia, Russia or whatever it was. You the know. gulags. Yeah, you know, again, because of um, certain things that happened when they had the uh, conference in Yalta, certain things were prom promised to the Russians. Again, we, and our, I say we, our 
uh, oh. representatives reneged on that promise, and therefore, you know, it helped them with the fester the Cold War attitude, you know, the mistrust, you know. Well, in World War II, how many, I don't know, over a million people died? I mean, so the, the, the number yeah, of, of people was staggering. Yeah, yeah. Vietnam was 50,000, 55,000. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, so could there have been guys kept behind, 10, 12, 15 guys, 30 guys, just as a bargaining chip? Certainly that's a possibility. Yeah. Kept in those jungles, uh, triple canopy jungle, kept mm -hmm. in a rat cage. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if they'd still be alive today because the treatment was so bad. Yeah. Uh, they didn't get, if you talk to guys who were there, like Jerry Coffey, they, they would get fed a, 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 a bowl of soup yeah. with a fish head in it, mm -hmm. right? That yeah. was their dinner. Yeah. Um, you know, with some rice and a, you know, basically broth. Yeah. They all lost tons of weight. So they didn't feed them very well, and of course the medical treatment was almost non-existent. Right. So would any still be alive today? It's possible. Yeah. Well, with me personally, I you know even if there's one that's still alive, you yeah. know we still need to do everything possible. It'd be quite a story. It'd be quite a story. But I think you know you mentioned before there was a gentleman that came back or uh, claimed to be uh, you know a soldier, and uh, basically the midnight the, our, the the government basically wanted him to go away. You know, like oh really? I yeah, don't bring it up, and you know, they, we don't want to talk about it. Leave country, get out of here. You know, so to me, you know, if we want to go ahead and honor our POWs or their memories, whatever, there still has to be concerted effort. Like I said, close the books, you know, and find out what's going on for the families, and also I think for future generations, because for those who are out there who do hear the story, and you know, have legitimate information, like I say, that leads to that, you know. It's, you know, want to make sure that when you do put on the uniform that you're going to be taken care of. And I believe for the most part that happens. But it's still in all, we need to fess up, you know, like some of the things that didn't, that weren't addressed, you know, or people were, um, uh, incidences, like I said, where we didn't come through for our, our people. Like that. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I, I've, I've talked to people and then other guys say, look, Bob, triple canopy jungle, plane crashes, you're never going to find it. I mean, it's just, you know, it's, yeah. there's no way. Now, with today's technology, with the the satellites and the optics they have, I mean, you can uh, find a pimple on a baseball from 500,000 feet. So, uh, there, I doubt if they're still out there today. If they are, they're camouflaged pretty darn well. Yeah. Um, and I think the guys, you know, at this point, you have to think about their age. They're all in their 80s now. Yeah. If, if they were alive, they'd be in their 80s. All right. But even if there was one, like say, that's yeah. still waiting for rescue, or like say, to be repatriated, you know, they'd probably again, be a slave at this point. Yeah, but I, you slave. know, I think we still have a moral obligation, and yeah. I know it's you know it's one of those things where you know why bring and, it up or why talk about and it. And brainwashed, but, uh, yeah, beyond belief. Yeah, well, you know, and the soul beaten down, their soul uh, just. But to, I'll tell you what, the invitation, like, we'll, we can talk hey, about give me a call. I'd things. like to hear what some of these yeah. guys have to say. Uh, yeah, I definitely want to do that because, like I said, I do believe it's an important story. They, they believe that there's still some there? Yes. And, like I say, what I... You what got I any do, evidence of it? Yes. There's some very heavy evidence on that. That's the reason why I wanted to go ahead and I pursue it you know, in a public way anyhow, you know. But, um, yeah, as soon as we do that, because, like I say, uh, we're not here on the pro and think that you don't bring anything that to the public attention if it's not substantiated from a number of different sources. Really? You know? Yeah. So I want to make sure, especially under my program, whatever I present, you know, I'm open to so, uh, anybody out there that has any information who wants to share it or uh, even questions, you know, when we do do the program anyhow. But yeah, I'd love to, have, you know, we'll keep your praise of what's going yeah, on. Yeah, let me know. And uh, come on and, uh, you know, join the discussion anyhow. But to me, again, if there's even one left out there, that individual needs to be well, brought home. Now. At the ledge every year, I've honored Vietnam veterans. Yeah. This year, I'm, I'm making an exception. I'm honoring a triple amputee from mm -hmm. Kaimoki High School, mm -hmm. Ryan Colfage, uh, from He got his <coughs> triple amputee, got his yeah. legs and arm blown off in, uh, I think it was uh, Iraq. Yeah. And so he's a local boy, never been honored here, so we're going to honor him in the State House. Yeah. March 16th, you come by, we're going to have lunch and everything. Good else. enough, then. 
So it's two Fridays from today. Two Fridays. Okay. Uh, we're getting down to the wire, but I want to give you a chance. To, is, there, what, is, what, is there anything else that you would like to discuss to make the public aware of that uh, we need to get involved in? Because, again, what we try to stress here is, in, you know, community involvement, even though, you know, you don't have the same, you know, sometimes different. Well, I'm happy that you continue to do what you do on the radio and on uh, ThinkTech, and you bring veterans' issues to light. You're one of the unsung heroes who's always behind the scenes okay. pushing veterans' issues. Uh, and making guys like me aware of what's going on. Mm. So uh, thank you, Cal. Oh, well, I appreciate it anyhow, you know. But thank you for what you're doing here. Yeah, yeah. Savior. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'll take you up on that lunch. I'll come down there and check on that. Yeah, but, please. Uh, Two Fridays from today. Yeah. So what else is going on that's immediate, like, say, that the public may need to be aware of? I know well, that there's a lot going on down at the square no. building, but uh, we'll run out of time. I see it's 1130 and the red light just came on, so... <laughs> the puzzle palace. Okay, I tell you what. In a Next minute, time. in a minute and a half or less. <laughs> okay, fill us on what's happening. So we uh, there's a it's a slow session. Yep. Mostly housekeeping issues. Mm -hmm. Mostly non-controversial issues. We do have the assisted suicide, which is going to pass. Yep. Uh, it's a major plank of the Democratic Party. I tell you, the testimony was 50, 54, 50 against. Uh, but it, the public polling shows that 80 percent support it. I don't think they they fully grasp what that means with a societal impact. Yeah. Um, however, it is what it is. I voted no, uh, and um, I don't make any judgments on anyone the way they voted because I view yeah. this as a conscience issue. It's mm -hmm. between you and your God, pretty much. Right. Uh, and that's how I voted. Yeah. Good. Well, that's the main thing. Actually, a lot of times we know people do not agree on certain things, but the thing is the involvement. You know, getting out there in the community, because we just sit back and just complain about. Yeah. How bad the situation is? No, you want to go up and either testify. I mean, even my some people think it's an exercise of futility, but the thing is, you have to do it. You know, it it, it often is, yeah. unless it's an issue that's hotly contested. Yeah, uh, your your opinion can sway one person, mm -hmm. uh, particularly if you live in his neighborhood. Yeah. So if I four or five people live in my neighborhood, I'm sure as hell going to listen to them because they're going to talk to everybody on their street. Right, yeah. And I want their support. Yeah. Got the quick, uh, coconut grapevine over here, you know, like say word of mouth, like yes. say it could be more um, instrumental, like say getting it out there than even sometime with the media, whatever, because yes. a lot of people, the mistrust, you know, people will trust their neighbor or their friends, you know, more sometimes than they do, yeah. like say watching that face on the tube or whatever. Sure. Okay, we're getting it out to the wire, but... Um, Representative Alex, I really appreciate you taking the time from your busy schedule to come down and talk to us. Like I said, we'll keep in touch. And like I said, the other issue, um, again, if anybody out there has any uh, thing they would like to interject, we'll make an announcement when we're going to do that program, which will may probably be in the next two weeks or so. But um, get involved and like I say, find out what's going on and um, don't complain. You know, the only thing I can take say. Take action. Take action. I like that. Yeah. Don't complain. Take action. Call your legislators. Their phone number's in the book. Yeah. I uh, thought so most of them were unlisted, but anyhow. No, no, they're, they're office numbers in the oh, book. Okay. <laughs> their anyhow. office number. <laughs> but get involved, and uh, we keep saying that over and over again. But yeah. thank you very much. And, um, Thanks, Gary. We're, we're going to take corrective action and All right. get ready for our next program. Thank you. God bless, and until that time. See you later.